Thank you, Carol. Um, if, if the discussion tonight is uh, Shanghai and its tall buildings, uh, it inevitably will be focused upon the urbanism that those tall buildings create. And um, to talk about urbanism, at least in our experience uh, in China and Japan, uh, I have to really first talk about this man, uh, Minyuro Mori. Uh, he is the uh, president of Mori Building. Um, Mori Building was started by his father, uh, who was a professor of economics at Yokohama University, and came to Tokyo and started building buildings. And uh, in, the, in the end of the 80s, uh, based on the value of Tokyo real estate at that time, uh, he was considered the world's wealthiest man. His son um, never said a word in any of the meetings that we held with Mr. Mori Sr. Uh, for perhaps two or three years when we met with him. Uh, his father met us in traditional kimono uh, and was 93 years old or 95 years old at the time we were working with him. Um, and his son sat silent. But this man uh, has led uh, not only the Rapungi Hills development in Tokyo, but also the World uh, Financial Center, uh, Shanghai World Financial Center. Uh, and I consider him to be uh, the most uh, brilliant urbanist that, that I have been exposed to. I think he has a greater understanding of what really makes a city a dynamic, vibrant place, uh, certainly than any other developer that I have worked with. He's standing in front of a model of Tokyo. Uh, he had someone ride around on a motor scooter in Tokyo photographing the facades of every building. And that model contains the facades of every building in Tokyo. And he built this model specifically to compare it to the density of Manhattan because he was on an advisory commi uh, commission in Tokyo and he wanted, he was convinced that Tokyo needs to become denser and based on Manhattan's model he was going to try to prove it uh, to, to everybody. His passion is for the urban development, particularly in Tokyo, to allow for a complete range of, of lifestyle activity uh, the amount of time that's spent commuting in Tokyo uh, for him is anathema. He wants to return people to the center of the city. Uh, and his development uh, occurs with a, an extremely focused philosophy in mind. Uh, the first buildings that his father basically did what, are what they called the numbered buildings. They all have numbers and they're all individual structures. Then he started to go through the Hills series. Is one, this Rapungi Hills, which I'm going to show you here, um, is part of. And now he's on to a third philosophical concept, which tries to develop um, very much of a, the, all of those functions that require minimum light. He plans on planting below gigantic landscaped areas. Uh, he's very influenced by Le Corbusier. He, holds, he has the largest collection of Le Corbusier drawings and, and uh, art, art objects of anybody in the world. Uh, and so this is a man who uh, can teach us all a lot, and he certainly has taught us a, a great deal. I'm going to show you Rapungi first, mainly to, to, to justify uh, what I've been saying about him as a, as a visionary, because Rapungi, uh, as opposed to Pudong, uh, has a tremendous urban vitality uh, and yet the architecture in Rapungi, by our own admission, uh, is, is uh, perhaps uh, uh, not nearly at the level uh, of, the, of, we believe, the, the World Financial Center. Um, but the buildings in their interaction with each other create such a dynamic that it isn't really the architecture that is important, but it's really the vitality of the urban experience. And this Mr. Mori understands probably better than anybody else on how to place very heterogeneous 
these seeming functions together in such a way that they create this great urban stew that sort of generates vitality. We started this project with him um, with a massive, massive building which was going to be sort of the economic workhorse for the Rapungi development, a 60,000 square foot office tower. Uh, and we decided that we wanted to be able to create it in a way that was uh, uh, connected to, to uh, characteristics of, uh, of the historic past. Uh, if I can, whoop, wrong one. Uh, and this shows the sort of the mix of pieces. You can see this, the central tower, uh, but a whole series of pieces. Uh, I guess I can't really point to this. Is there a pointer on here? Yeah, there is. Okay. Can you show me how to? Well, uh, the, as you can see, the heterogeneity as a brute, uh, but as at the ground level, the tremendous intensity that it takes place uh, is something that uh, if you haven't experienced it, it, it I highly recommend it. Um, but here is Mr. Mori uh, in, in uh, Shanghai, uh, and I show this picture, not, it was in the cover of Fortune magazine, and, and uh, I assume he's proud of it, but uh, what, what I uh, feel it indicates is that he was in Shanghai uh, restricted to the design of a single building. He no longer could explore his urban philosophy as it extended into a much larger uh, field of interest, and he had to confine all of his imaginative thinking to the, to the concept of one single building. And so the concept of creating a building that is essentially a city within a city was very much on his mind. Uh, Mr. Mori, I, I've always said, is, is somewhat like the P.T. Barnum of, of uh, development. I mean, he really understands what pleases people. Uh, and those are the ingredients that he wants to include uh, in, in, his, in his buildings. Oh, I keep pressing the wrong one here. Okay, so this uh, circle, as you can see, the, the bottom portion of it, uh, which is essentially to the east of the uh, Hangpo River, uh, is an area uh, called Lujazwi. Now, Lujazwi is part of Pudong. Pudong is a much bigger area, but the Lujazwi area is where the uh, high intensity development of, of, of tall buildings has taken place. The planning for this started in 1990 uh, in China. Uh, you have to re recognize what the, the purpose of all of this is. It's, it was intended as a financial trade zone. It was intended to bring in international investment into China to, to connect China to the world. And of course, uh, you know, Hong Kong has always been connected internationally, but Shanghai was to represent another sort of link to the outside world. And all of this investment was to be then placed into this extremely confined area uh, in Lujazwi. And when they started the initial uh, designs, they invited oh, seven or eight different countries to submit master planning concepts for it. Uh, and then ultimately, uh, the ideas for Lujazwi were developed then as, as a distillation uh, from the variety of, of, of submissions that have been made. But the fundamental purpose here of the, of, of this entire development zone was to be able to build a financial infrastructure in China as quickly as possible and to be able to attract as much uh, of financial development as quickly as possible. And so the, the real, I think the real uh, emphasis behind this was to place the fewest uh, restrictions on the individual entities that were coming in to create the development. And the first, um, this particular uh, the master plan uh, was developed. There are um, 80 tall buildings here, the lowest of which is 40 stories in height. 
Uh, and this was the uh, master plan that had come about uh, as a result of that uh, two-year process uh, starting in 1990. There are three tall buildings at the center of all of this, um, right in here. Uh, and the tallest of these uh, was the building which is the subject of, of our discussion tonight. Uh, now that has subsequently been revised. Uh, the first of the three buildings was built by the Chinese government. That's called the Jim Mao Tower. The second was built by Mr. Mori, and the third then it was initially intended to be the lowest of the three buildings. It is now the tallest of the three buildings. And I assume that there's a, a level of nationalism involved in the desire to have the tallest building being built by the Chinese government. So at, when we first started, when we first went over to Shanghai, uh, this, is, this is the landscape that we, uh, we looked at. Uh, it uh, had, was dominated by the Oriental Pearl TV Tower, which was at the time the tallest building and a structure in the world. Uh, and that structure was 468 meters high, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and became the one dominant piece of the landscape to which one could, in fact, relate a tall building in, in designing uh, for it. Now, when one designs in China, you know, how does one design a super tall building? Uh, and, of course, uh, one possibility was to, to think of it in traditional terms. Uh, another possibility is to think of it as, as something quite different from that. Uh, what we in fact did was to try to find a way of dealing with the basic dynamic of a tall building as that which was anchored into the earth and created a relationship between the earth and the sky. I mean, that's sort of the essence of the tall building, the dramatization of that particular fundamental issue of the relationship between earth and sky became somewhat of the, of the genesis for the building. Ancient Chinese represented uh, in their burial tombs, uh, they represented the earth uh, with a square prism, and as you can see, the horizontal striations and of dark stone, and the heavens they represented as a circular disk uh, of light stone. Uh, and so it occurred to us that the possibility of creating an extremely simple building, uh, because within this cacophony of 80 tall buildings, each of which had an entirely different architectural style with no regulation whatsoever, uh, the intention at this time was to be able to create the simplest possible building that created an abstract, a powerfully abstract relationship that hopefully was based on something that had a strong connection uh, to Chinese history without resorting to uh, any sort of pagoda designs. So um, that brought about then the transformation of the, what, uh, as at the top you can see the, um, up on top here you can see the uh, square prism, uh, and that's, uh, I did it again, uh, that square prism was interacted by a series of sort of cosmic arcs. And the carving of the, those, that uh, the prism uh, into uh, the form you see at the bottom uh, was the, the, the basic idea behind the building itself. So when we talk about the building being a relationship between the circle and the square, uh, it is really the diagram on the right-hand side. Those are the circles. That is the circle, this cosmic arc cutting through the building that would form the, the genesis of the building. Uh, it's, it, you'll see why there's a confusion as to what the, the issue of the circle really uh, is. It, it, after I show you a couple more slides, but what this shape does is generate two different, fundamentally two different types of floor plates. One is basically a square, which is ideal for office space, and the other is basically sort of a lozenge shape, which is ideal for hotel space. And the, we have two fundamental programmatic components. We have a hotel at the top, we have at the base of it office structure. There are many other uh, components as well, but those are the two fundamental driving geometries. Uh, so uh, this uh, building was presented to the Chinese authorities uh, in 1993, I believe, Josh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and at that pre particular presentation, there were 14 professors of architecture, each of whom had one half hour to respond to my 10-minute presentation. Uh, and uh, the, it went from, it went from uh, Chinese to Japanese to English, so my 
uh, ability to, to, to really get the essence of the criticism was somewhat diminished, but nevertheless, um, we pre in the first presentation, I thought it was going to get this all off to a great start. The, uh, there was a wonderful elderly woman that had a beautiful smile on her face, and uh, she got up and she looked at, uh, out at me and she said in English, and these were the only words that were spoken in English that day, she said, well, perhaps this building is acceptable, but it certainly isn't desirable. And then it sort of went from, from bad to worse. And, and, uh, but we never really got a synopsis of the criticism that day, uh, but uh, it, it arrived uh, via the Hong Kong uh, newspapers uh, a while later. Uh, the translation of the building from square to, to line on the top, from the heaviness of the earth to the lightness in the sky, is best illustrated by this diagram, which shows all of the transformations of the floor plates. Um, and the structural system by Les Robertson, uh, which is a whole discussion in itself, is an extremely inventive structural system uh, based on, as you can see, outrigger floors that take place every 13 floors, which are necessary for these refuge floors that are part of the Chinese code. And if this building has a point of view about sustainability, it, it comes in the form of embodied energy because so much of the building's energy that it ultimately consumes is, is a product of what goes into the building. And this building has perhaps per square foot, and given its height, pro the, one of the most efficient structural systems that uh, certainly Les has ever done, and uh, we consider him to be uh, the dean of structural engineers. So uh, I won't go any further, but there was a need for an aperture on the top of the building. Uh, and the aperture that seemed to be most successful was a, a circular aperture. Uh, all of that linked very nicely, we, I believed, into in, in a, to the uh, moon gates that are regularly present in Chinese gardens. Uh, and um, all of the critiques, uh, critics of the building saw this. They saw the Japanese flag, uh, which uh, for a building that is to be the tallest building in China, uh, did, it didn't get things off to a good start. So it, 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 I understood, after all of that, what the criticism was about. Um, I went to, for an emergency meeting with Mr. Mori and the mayor of Shanghai in Tokyo for a one-hour meeting, and I suggested placing a bridge across the circle, as sort of the symbolizing uh, joining together of two sides. And uh, I would receive this wonderful letter. There's actually a gold seal on the bottom, which we we should have uh, emphasized here, but nevertheless, uh, in great appreciation for having uh, sort of dealt this Henry Kissinger-like uh, contribution to, to the, the, the dialogue between two countries. Uh, but that didn't necessarily last that long. The idea behind the circle was to try to create a solid void relationship between the Oriental Pearl TB Tower and our tower, which we turned in direct uh, axial relationship with the Oriental Pearl TB Tower, um, and at the top, uh, referring back to Mr. B uh, Morey's P.T. Barnum days, uh, placing a gondola ride that went around that uh, circle itself, uh, and that whole inverted cone out at the base there is a, is a queuing device, much like the Guggenheim Museum, uh, but everybody waiting to get onto the gondola. Uh, so uh, uh, that uh, probably would have been a dramatic uh, entity, and we did, went a long way with the structural design of this, Les Robertson did, and, and we did complete designs for it, but um, it, it was ill-fated, as I'll show you later. Uh, the base of the building was intended to be something that was extremely um, connected into the earth, and so as a result, the dramatization of the, the, the base of the building conceptually was in, intended to be extremely heavy. Uh, the building, as I've shown you before, uh, I won't go into all of the components that surround it, but uh, the hotel floor plate is on the upper corner up here, and the office floor plate here, so you can see how the efficiency of these two played a huge role. But one thing I should mention are these two corner elevators that take place here and take place here. Those are express elevators that go up through the building, connecting one up into this observation platform on the top, because one of Mr. Morey's fundamental uh, intentions with a tall building is to make it a civic entity. He did it in Tokyo, he's doing it, he did it in Shanghai. In other words, if the top of the building can be something that is, is for everybody, 
uh, for him, then, the building becomes not just a representation of the private enterprise, but it becomes something that is a civic symbol. Uh, and uh, we couldn't uh, agree more. Uh, the um, building with the circular form uh, ultimately uh, met with re uh, great resistance, uh, particularly uh, after the Internet started to become uh, a means of expressing one's opinion. Uh, and the, the relationship of the circle uh, uh, to, uh, to the, the place uh, was uh, really perceived as unacceptable. And so uh, what we ultimately did is translated it into a, a, a form probably more natural to the geometry of the building. All of this up above here is space where one, uh, observation space, one can come up and take a bridge across the top, which I'll show you a photograph of. On the top of the hotel, which is, is down in here, uh, there's a three-story stack of, of uh, dining facilities that's called Club 100, uh, or Century 100, excuse me, and it is a... Uh, incredible uh, uh, series of rooms, and I can say that because the entire Park Hyatt Hotel, which is in the blue, uh, was designed by Tony Chi, who is an architect here in, in uh, New York, and is perhaps one of the most beautiful hotels that uh, I've certainly encountered any place in the world. Uh, and it is a place of tremendous energy. Uh, but as you can see, the, the office space then uh, basically uh, uh, dealing with the main bulk of the building. Refuge floor is taking place every 13. We have elaborate sky lobby system, which you can see there. And at the base of the building, we have uh, uh, museums at the, here at conference facilities. We have retail facilities at the base here. And there's four primary entrances. There's a primary entrance for hotel, for the, uh, one for the sky observation, one for the, uh, the office building, and one for the retail. So the, the intention was at the base of the building to cluster it with stru uh, smaller structures, uh, which could then, whoops, I should go back, uh, which could then sort of um, at a scale which is much more approachable than that of the, the extremely tall building, uh, animate the streetscape. And um, in the future, Mr. Mori is going to be developing an extension of the retail under the park over here. Uh, and one of the issues that we'll probably discuss about Pudong is that, frankly, there just isn't enough density in Pudong. All the tall buildings have been built, but what's really needed is a lot of stuff that fills things in. And Mr. Moore is in the process of doing a, a cultural facility across the street, some retail facility here uh, underneath it, uh, in addition to what already exists. Uh, so here are the, here's the building on the skyline and its relationship to all of it and the, hopefully the serenity of its building, its form in relationship to the, the, the texture of the city uh, and its relationship to the Oriental Pearl TV Tower. Uh, there's a great lake that takes place in the middle of uh, the Le Jesuit area and so this is directly off of that. Uh, and the building from one side looks one way but from another side it looks entirely different. Uh, and from at night time it's illuminated in such a way that uh, try to dramatize its vertical height. Um, the external skin of the building is extremely efficient from an energy perspective in terms of the amount of material placed into the skin. Uh, it, is, it has one horizontal spandrel uh, that is opaque and one for vision per floor. So there's two divisions per floor uh, and it creates an extraordinary uh, efficiency, but we didn't need for the uh, the surface of the building to be agitated, we needed to be extremely serene. Uh, th this is the entrance into the hotel, so th this experience here uh, is one that is very different. Uh, uh, as, uh, as one comes in, Tony uh, starts his work at that point, and as he comes into it, uh, there are three uh, Tony Chi's, uh, Tony's ball has a bald head, and there are three Tony Chi's bowing to you as you come in the elevator, which is uh, is a, is a wonderful uh, way to arrive. And then at the top, this is that uh, three-story stack of restaurants that I told you about, which is constantly filled and impossible to get a table at. Uh, uh, this is the entrance then to the observation, and uh, that is, all of this is queuing for tour buses and all of that. Uh, if one goes in and experiences this type of world, and the very top has a bridge with a glass floor which looks down uh, to the city below. Uh, then the entrance to the office lobby, uh, and the office lobby uh, has an interesting and rather curious two-story con condition presently because uh, there is anticipated a, a bridge system for the entire 
uh, Luzhe's Wee area uh, to connect all of the buildings, and this building has uh, uh, anticipated the uh, bridge system, but if you, in fact, uh, go to these doors and make an attempt to walk out, you're not going to be successful. Uh, but uh, what will ultimately be the case is a bridge system that, uh, frankly, covers roads that are far too wide for any pedestrian to cross <laughs> and under safe circumstances. Uh, and, uh, you know, the success of a two-story, uh, of a bridge system, the High Line in New York is, is one thing. It feeds itself through the density of urban fabric and is relatively restricted in its length. Um, it's, it's, uh, the jury's still out on the success of the bridge system here. Um, but I thought I might show you our response to the third site, uh, the, the intention to build a building that's 100 meters higher, was the part of the, and sponsored by the Chinese government. Uh, and so this was our solution to the, uh, that uh, competition. Uh, the intention in, in the early sketch here of mine was to try to find a way of creating a relationship between the World Financial Center uh, and the, the um, uh, Oriental Pearl TV Tower, uh, and so you can see the obvious relationship between the geometries there. Um, and the intention of creating a, a zoning of a, of a floor plate that dealt with a sort of a public-private type of uh, uh, connection, and uh, these are the various uh, uh, components of the building itself. Uh, the, the entire vertical mast was intended for public transportation, and then a whole series of atria, which are stacked up, uh, yeah, along that vertical mast and uh, various pieces of the uh, interior of it. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jamie.